Hello. Um, so I have a question regarding uh, the, uh, I don't know how far into production the idea of the fourth season of the Netflix show, especially going off with like what happened to Starscream towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, after he was, uh, his mind was Cthulhu by Unicron, uh, he kind of turned into sort of like a pop and he was talking about all, like, you know, all this bad stuff, which I thought was a, an interesting idea to go with the character. It's like oh, yeah. the, the schemer, now he was like, I'm really scared all the time of somebody that's not Megatron. Yeah. So I was wondering um, how far that got along and uh, what kind of things people were talking about maybe doing with Starscream. I don't know how much you can talk about that. Or... Um, well, I think that uh, FJ said a lot of this already, so I'm pretty sure I can talk about it. But uh, th there was a lot of like parallel reality, crisis of infinite Earth stuff happening, and it was all Unicron, which was that kind of stuff. So that's why, I don't know if there's any Doctor Who fans, but it was very much like the master hearing the, the, the oh, wow. head, you know, where it was going to be a constant in the Starship's head, so he was going to kind of be the vehicle <laughs> um, uh, that uh, would, you know, make a lot of that stuff happen. Um, and this is all just through talking to people that I found this out. Like, we never got to any kind of, like, he hears a script or something like that, but... <sighs> Not being sure what I can say, I'm gonna stop there. But all I'll say is, man, it would have been cool. Yeah, it looks oh, like oh, it was oh, pretty yeah. exciting. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that you see in the toys and on the side of the boxes now too. That were like, that would have made so much more sense. Okay, anyway, yeah, I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, hey brother. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're obviously a big Transformers fan, and sorry if this question's already been asked. Of all the characters you have. Have the opportunity to voice. If you could voice any character you're choosing, who for let's say regularly for a season, who would you really want to do? Ooh, regular for a season? Yeah. Um. Oh gosh, I don't know if it's first season or second season. Uh, somebody helped with Blue Streak. He was he was first, right? He was the '84, right? Yes. Um, Blue Streak, because there's this thing in his bio which I thought was really fun where he talks a lot and jokes a lot. <laughs> uh, and he does so to mask this pain of his entire city being destroyed. And it's just got this like really cool Spider-Man aspect to it that like, you know, like using humor as defense mechanism because of the pain inside. So I think like, I mean, it's kind of a dour, depressing answer I'm giving sure, but, uh, but yeah, that'd be really fun to chew on to try to like figure out that little balance of like, oh, shut up, Blooster. Yeah, shut up, Rat Trap, right? Uh, but like, what is that masking? And like, it'd be cool character stuff. Thank you. Sorry. That was a really actory answer they gave. Oh, I also like, you know, I mean, cool. <laughs> not my question, but, uh, you know, we're adults now, right? And I often wonder, like, if we could, it'll never happen, but, like, an HBO Max style series where we uh, could delve into that kind of stuff. The characters yeah. in their backgrounds would be amazing. I mean, War of Cyber and Cop did, like, it's, it's war. What happens in war, you know? What happened to Alita? It's, 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 I like it. I like it. Because it's like a lot of our, our favorite franchises. They grow with us. The characters grow with us, you know? Um, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Hello, mister. Hello. You look vaguely familiar. Hmm. I saw you somewhere. I you were in a swamp somewhere, didn't I? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it's not easy to be Not at all. <laughs> anyway, I was going to ask you about your toy collection. I know you, uh, dabble <laughs> <laughs> in action figures, and, um, What's, what's your favorite thing to collect? Transformers? Transformer figures of yourself? Or some other line? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so I've got, uh, in an undisclosed location back in New York, uh, probably about a hundred boxes just full of toys. Wow. Full of toys. And then the ones that came over uh, to LA have somehow multiplied into almost as much. And my recording at home, where I like recorded, like through pandemic, a lot of, like most of Cuphead was done through pandemic, you know? Remote, in these, in these booths that we, you know, cobbled together or built or had, spent a million dollars on. The walls of mine are built of rubber made containers filled with toy robots and space wizards. <laughs> and when you think about the car game PVC that you buy and stuff, it does really good. So whenever I dial into a studio and someone's like, wow, 
It's really, do, do, do you have a whisper room? It sounds really good. I'm like, toys. Toys and sound blankets and PVC tubes that I made myself. <laughs> so, uh, I have a lot of toys. Yes. And I do have the, uh, the display of narcissism, I like to call it, which is all of my star screams that are in G1 continuity, because com like, uh, the Prime Wars and War for Cybertron are G1 continuity. So I took all those out of the box and then bought all the little oh, cultures. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's canon when I make them fight. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed the last part, and then everybody laughed, and I didn't hear what you said. I don't know, some pun, probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was hilarious. <laughs> I do. So, uh, you mentioned earlier a bit about Scott McNeil being, being part of the what got you into voice acting sort of thing. Are there any other uh, actors or voice actors who served as inspirations to you or who may have mentored you at some point? Gosh, um, I'll tell you one story. Uh, I remember one of the early BotCons, like it was either like 2000, 2002 or something, uh, Greg Berger was there. And uh, I have two stories I'll say. Greg Berger and uh, uh, Mike McConnell, uh, the voice of Tracks and Cosmos. So, Greg, I was a little kid, I made my own demo. Uh, it was something called a compact disc that we had back then. It's kind of like from the, the Iconic Peace movie, the things that they shot out of their wrists. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the same thing, in a sense. Two people as old as I am. <laughs> He man, that's just the universe. Go all over the place. Uh, so I gave him this CD with this photocopied cover and stuff. Like, Excuse me, sir, may I give you this? You know. And uh, Greg said, No, not unless I give you mine. He and his wife stopped what they were doing, left the floor, went upstairs to the hotel room, came downstairs and handed me the demo. And I'm like, Good luck, just gave you know, and it was just this kindest thing, and it stuck with me to the point like I carry that with me. Where like every apartment that I've lived in and stuff, it's kind of like he made the trip across country with me, uh, and I've gotten to work with Greg. And like I'll, I told him the story, I've got I used to MC too for conventions and stuff, and I told him that backstage, and like we yeah, had hugged it out and stuff, and then we got to work. And we're in uh, Prime Wars together, uh, texting. So that was amazing. Uh, and similar story with me, but, but what, the, what I'll say from that is he gave me some amazing advice at this, at this body con that I, whenever someone asks me, like, how do you do voice acting? This is one of the main things that I relay, and I you know, say, you know, that's what he told me. So, when you have butterflies in your stomach, which you're going to do, it's going to happen, don't try to get rid of them. Make them fly in formation. Meaning, like, use that and direct it. Use that energy to do the thing, uh, love the thing, and anything, not just voice acting. Uh, and that's another thing that, like, just really stuck with me. So there's a lot of, and, like, you do these things, and you meet people, and you talk to them, and you understand, like, there's just such solid, good people. David, we became friends, like, uh, way before I was able to pay the rent this way, you know? Like, uh, there's just so many really good people in this biz. I don't know if I'm answering your question anymore. I feel like I'm just getting sentimental. Keep <laughs> yeah. going. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Um, what was it like working on Cuphead? Wonderful. <laughs> I love. Uh, is it's like time travel, I guess. I'll say there's a lot of sci-fi happening in this panel. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. you know what you're getting. Uh, it's like you're getting to originate a character that no one's done before. But to do so from like the 1930s, you know, like that Fleischer era. So, like, uh, like the Bug Bang voice that I do is, you know, it's not really like a uh, Bugs Bunny or Bugs Big or any of those guys, but he can like hang out with them sometimes. But a lot of it is actually just my family members, you know, like, because I'm an Italian guy from New York. And like, like the, like, if you watch all the other little characters that I play, like, because a lot of times I'm like, we're going to need you to be a worm and an eggplant bouncer this time. So the eggplant, but like, not on the list. That's my Uncle George, you know? So, like, there's a lot of, uh, again, me getting too sentimental. This is where, where Frank cries the panel. Uh, like, so there's, like, a lot of family members that are no longer with us that are now on, you know, streaming services and, and 
people were forced to watch this and laugh at it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that there was an answer in there somewhere. I mean, we'll fix it in post, right? <laughs> I loved it, and I the game is too hard. Yeah. Want to hear a funny story about the game? Yeah. All right. Uh, caffeine's kicking in. So, uh, Cuphead the game is really hard. Has anybody played Cuphead? No. Yes. yes. My son plays it. Is it hard? Yes. It is very difficult. Uh, True Valentino uh, became a good friend. He's the voice of uh, Cuphead. So, like, I play Dungeons and Dragons every Monday. It's fun. Uh, but they, Netflix invited us to do some kind of like promo for them a long time ago, and they had us playing the game. And, uh, uh, we were terrible. We just kept dying. <laughs> we're two comedians. We're supposed to be like riffing off this thing, and it got depressing because we're just dying, and they're just making jokes about dying for like ten minutes, just jokes about dying, and like how are you gonna? You know? So they ended up playing a video that someone else took of them playing the game and having us just do this because we were so terrible, and like eh, we're riffing off it. Of it, and then at one point, like, like if you if you go if you watch the video, you'll see me like, oh, this is gonna take crap at Jack Tiny, and then the actual video is my man. <laughs> <laughs> so there, we're terrible. <laughs> I have another question. You, you mentioned a couple times how that you're an Italian from New York. Yeah. When you got into voice acting, did you have to? Take any Italian from New York out of your voice? Is that anything you're training you had to do to like get rid of that New York Italian voice? You know, that, it's weird. Like my my mother's from the South Bronx, my father's from Canarsie, Brooklyn, but neither of them really have that act. Like it's 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 really not super prevalent, you know. Like we don't forget about it. Or walk it in, you know, like in cartoons, it's great. But like like when I talk about the impression of small my older brother. You know, like it would say turlet instead of toilet, you know, that, right. that kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, there was nothing like, I, nothing really. I mean, there's, there are some things. I am going to go back, uh, scratch that out. I cannot say the word compass saved my life. What is the thing that tells you where true north is? Everybody say it at once. Compass. Compass. It's a compass. It's not a compass. What's a compass? You encompass something. You don't encompass something, right? Somebody help me. But yeah, that was like, that, that, that's the one word that I always get been caught up on, you know, when I drink my water. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Hello. I was just wondering, because there seems to be two kinds of star scream. Screechy or hissy. Mm. And yours is a little hissy. Like, I was wondering, like, was that, like, more choice? Like, do you kind of lean towards a more, like, like, that kind of voice? or? Because I know Steve Bloom did a really great sort of that kind of star scream, so I was wondering if there was a bunch of different influences, or were you just like, this is star scream, this is what he sounds like, this is what he is. The first one was like a big beef stew. Like, there was a bunch of different uh, things. That, so, the, uh, the showrunner of the first show that I was in, Eric Calderon. Um, get ready for another long story? Is that from New York? Sure. Uh, so, his idea for the voice was like Lord Varys from uh, from Game of Thrones, because he was a politician in Combiner Wars. He was like there was a mystery there and stuff. So when he spoke, it was it was informed by the original one, but it was very sort of honeyed voices and whispers in the dark. And uh, and I, I loved that. I thought it was really cool. Uh, but yeah, there was there was this evolution where. Um, I got a phone call from him. It was originally a phone call, phone call saying, we don't think we can hire you because we don't know what we want. And I was in a grocery store in, a, in Metropolitan Avenue in Queens and walked out and stood by the dumpster in the backyard, uh, in the back of the store, the parking lot, took this phone call. Uh, and he was like, oh, well, Lord Ferris, I did this. And he kept going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then he got someone else in line, went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then uh, by the end of that call, I was cast on a plane the next day and recording the day after that, because that's how fast this stuff goes sometimes. Um, but it was definitely like created uh, on this phone call next to a dumpster in Queens, which is a cool like. Uh, so there's that instruction. Then War for Cybertron, he's younger. This is technically right before G1 starts. Because yes. it's the same continuity until like the, you know, that Chirac Optimus throws the, the 
allspark, and the space bridge, and it ruins everything. Yeah. Uh, or makes it cool. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's, that's a very different, he's a little more like angsty, you know? I think about like, he was still, he was, just, he was a scientist in his teens, and then he kind of, you know, I was kind of hateful, and then he grows up, and by the end, uh, I think my favorite version is that kingdom kind of thing. Where he does have that hissy thing, but he's he can still go up and and well, well wait uh, this is what I thought and then bumblebee oh, no. I love that it's my favorite scene too. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gosh, you're random. <laughs> Hello there. Can you talk a little bit about what your schedule is like as a voice actor? Um, when typical day. Uh, I know that you work for a company and you've talked about how you hop from various uh, studios. Uh, what's that like? And uh, it, it, I'm sure it's got to be exciting every time you still go to those gates, right? Oh, God, yes. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, bruises all over because I pinch myself uh, that I didn't get to pay the rent this way. But um, typical day, uh, you audition more than you record because you constantly come in. But if you have like a back to back day, that you're staying up late and doing that, or trying to find time and have a very understanding fiance, and, you know. Uh, but yeah, through pandemic, a lot of stuff was remote, so you don't need that much time in between. But LA traffic, you have to like add an hour for everything. So you're going across, you have to go to Sony over there. And you have to leave at least two hours to get back because nothing is actually 20 minutes, even though they say it's 20 minutes. LA's weird. Uh, <laughs> gosh, I think like. My agent's in Beverly Hills. I went there once, it was 35 minutes to drive there. Not rush hour, it took me three hours to drive back to Burbank. And that was nonsense. LA is a nonsense. We need matter transporters. Someone, that's the technology. You know, AI, put that aside. We just need, need to someone, matter energy conversion? No. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, and then some days you don't have anything booked, and then some weeks you have like multiples per day. So it's unpredictable, but uh, Hi again. Um, you mentioned you played Dungeons and Dragons. Oh yes. yeah, yeah. And I'm a I'm a huge fan of the game. Of course, I played for over 20 years now, probably. Oh, or, really? or oh, maybe a little less. My perception of time's a little bit not the best at times. But um, that's true. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what edition do you play? And what's your favorite class? Great question. <laughs> I wanted to know too. This is the battle. <laughs> Uh, all right, so, um, funny story. I'm in the same second ed game that I was in 1991 with the same guys. We've been playing straight since then, but I made the character when I was 13 years old, so it's ridiculous. Uh, I, when I first started playing, before I met those guys, we couldn't afford the books. So I had a marble notebook that I made up rules in, and we stole dice from like a Sorry or whatever, or cheesy. And I made up rules as we went along, and we'd sit next to the teeter totter or in somebody's basement, and we'd play. So by the time I got there, I made this character that was part every chromatic dragon, part every metallic dragon, part beholder, part uh, umber hulk, part elf. And, and they're very understanding guys who have the books. Uh, and again, 13 years old. And they let me do it, and then I rolled it. My highest roll was a 12. I couldn't support my own body. Because I drew this thing like Sam Keith would have drawn. He had four arms and big leathery wings and tusks. And his name was Pax, which is peace in Latin. So like, wow, this is really cool. I was polymorphed into an elven bard. Because <laughs> he was a bard. Because he invented the electric guitar because I was 13 years old. <laughs> and I love Rush. Great band. So, yeah. Right, I do. I, I ran over to somebody and like accosted them in a rush T-shirt um, on the floor and like I just flew into YYZ. This is the coolest thing. It's like oh yeah, my brother helped with that album. <laughs> uh, this isn't answering your question. So, uh, gosh, I just started uh, a five E game. Well, I, I've been playing five E Spelljammer game, uh, and then um, yeah, I'm in the two E game. We're in three three different two E games. Uh, Vampire the Masquerade, a Sabbath game, 
uh, uh, Star Wars, the old uh, West End game Star Wars. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm running a Last Unicorn Star Trek: The Next Generation game, which don't tell any of the players. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna, they're gonna go into an anomaly, and I'm gonna hand them sheets uh, virtually of all the characters from the other games that we're playing, and they're all gonna have to. Why did I just say that on tape? Uh, tape, tape. Yeah, you didn't say it on tape. Don't worry. <laughs> All the cartilage just dissolved. <laughs> just um, uh, but I'm really liking 5e. We just started a 5e game, uh, the one with True, the one with, uh, that we've been playing two days. Like, you guys care what day we play it on. Um, and I'm a dwarven fighter. And I chose that because I thought it would be training wheels on this new system. My god, the feats are crazy. It's cool, but it's like choosing spells. Uh, and I'll say I, I like that. Um, <coughs> I, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll save the Dwarven Fighter because I love this character that I'm playing. However, I just spent a hero point to sing a song as a fighter, a Dwarven Fighter. It was on the flute of my dead son and stuff, but, you know, nobody else cares about Dungeons and Dragons, right? No. Anyway. So there. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I oh, appreciate that. Uh, my favorite class is from, uh, 3rd edition, uh, yep. The Alienist. If All right. anyone's familiar with that. The only D and D setting that lets you uh, summon Cthulhu at will. That's so, amazing. Yeah, I think I'm a battle master. Is that yeah for five E right now? Uh, maybe I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not as familiar with five E as third edition. But nah, thank you. Yeah. Ranger second edition, I guess, was my default. Great question. I, I was literally going to go up and ask that. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I have a Cuphead question for you. Of course. If you could voice any other character in Cuphead, uh, which would you choose? Oh gosh, I forget his name. Uh, the guy that pilots the big robot in the game. Oh, I know who you mean. You know what I'm talking about? Just because I like giant robots. <laughs> Weird, right? Oh, that's, a, that's a good choice. That's yeah. <laughs> Hi. Well, first off, awesome job with the uh, character that you've got over here. And uh, two part questions. Uh, when you got the Part to play uh, Starscream. Were there concerns that you might lose your voice or have a lot of strains? Because he has like a really. Oh no, this is what I normally sound like. <laughs> Everything else is put on. <clears throat> no, when I was born, I said, Wow, mommy, yeah! <laughs> and then they were like, Oh god, you're annoying. <laughs> it was predestination. <laughs> no, there's like a, a place in my throat where I can just do that. I don't know what it is. I'm deformed. <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't really, that one doesn't hurt. There's other things that do hurt, like, uh, I do a lot of creature stuff. So, like, um, if, I, if I have a four-hour session, I'm like, <laughs> like that. So sometimes, you know, chunks of throat come out after the fifth hour. <laughs> but, uh, but even so, I mean, like, that's sort of like what you train for. It's kind of like focusing on muscle when you do something. Uh, yeah, you train to get these things out, because you should never take a role that is going to hurt you, you know? Uh, and, uh, yes, I can do stuff. Yeah. My other question is, if you got the chance to play D&D with Starscream and Rock Trap, how do you think that would go? Well, I mean, who's the DM? I feel like Starscream would probably be the DM. I keep throwing around this idea, actually, of running a game at conventions as Starscream. Oh. And I mean, being Starscream in the game, but Starscream is also the DM, and then just like <laughs> stealing whoever's a guest to like kind of come in. Uh, I don't know. I think I feel like it'd be fun. Careful, I'll tell Colin. Do it! I, I would love to. <laughs> I mean, uh, two great, great tastes go together. Tastes great together? Yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. Thank you. No. Hi! Hello again. Um, I just wanted to know your opinion about the uh, overall opinion of the Prime Wars trilogy. It was really fun to do. It was really cool. Um, everywhere was awesome. Records were super fun. Uh, God, John Nelson's just like the sweetest guy in the world. Uh, I had interviewed him, uh, God, two years earlier, I think, at uh, BotCon. Uh, and dude is like the coolest guy in the world. He shows up on a motorcycle in a trench coat and he saved the hat from BotCon. And when we did the BTS thing, he uh, kept it with him and stuff. Uh, it, just, it, was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And like, such dear friends were made through that, too. 
uh, some literally moved into the same apartment complex as me because we would drink scotch together a bunch, you know, like, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was great, it was a great experience all together. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Long time I see. Yeah, you? it's been a while. Uh, That's one. If Red Trap and Kermit were going through a drug, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, Extra cheese! <laughs> All right, no flies, please. Um, my real question, uh, and this might be a stupid question if the answer is no, because I'm trying to remember, I think it was you I had talked to at some point, but uh, Transformers TCG, did you have something to do with that, or did I imagine that? Um, and if the answer is yes, are you able to? Yes. Uh, you're sure you're talking about the, the Wizards one, right? Yes, I yeah. think so. so yeah. If that's the one. Was there more than one? Yeah, <laughs> I think there's another one now, but uh, the one that was the for Wizards. So this is a weird Venn diagram. Uh, Drew Nolasco was the kind of the guy who spearheaded that, right? <coughs> Drew Nolasco and I are old friends that used to go to goth clubs and do nerd stuff together back in New York. I had no idea if he was doing this game. I got hired to do, like, promo for that game with Abby Trot. Like, well, it's a really cool game too. Like, if anybody's ever played it, like, it's a really, it, the rule, it, it, it was wonderful. It's too bad it's gone. But yeah, that was a weird kind of, the Venn diagram comes into a circle, like, oh my god, now we get to work together, it's really great. Uh, but yeah, his, he ended up working for Watsi. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it was a super fun. But I mean, I had nothing to do with making the game, but I enjoyed the heck out of it and collected a bunch of it and played it at the conventions and such. Uh, and then uh, got to do a little Star Trek thing for with Windblade. It was like a little two-man comedy bit as well. Nice. All right. Um, I guess I can go. Do you have a question? I got one. I got one. Go for it for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, more so, I just wanted to mention that you did this, I guess, and then you can comment on it if you like. Um, I don't know if people are aware, but you were also Cobra Commander for the uh, Sky Striker as <laughs> Yes, I was. And then uh, <clears throat> there was like a, a video game called Smite, and they had like a little DLC and uh, Cobra for that and a couple of other things. Yeah. Oh, I, really? I love Cobra, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I love, I love um, God, we were just talking about last night, how how he's actually like a hidden genius, and he like pretends to be the fool. Was it Resolute, I think, when he came out? And it was like, I, for you, it served, my, it served me to be the fool. I love Cobra. I love Cobra. All right, now before I get on to my question, I want to follow up on that, because I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, there is a long history of Starscream voice actors also voicing Cobra Commander. So when you did it, did you audition for the part, or did someone just say, well, who's, who's, who's one of the recent Starscreams and call you to see if you wanted to do Cobra? The, the first time I did it, they called me. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, did a little backflip and then ran to my booth and did it. It was, uh, it was pretty fun. I think it was, uh, gosh, I think it was the, the first one was that Sky Striker promo. But, uh, gosh, he's, he's really cool. Yeah. All right, now that, the actual question I, I had, uh, if you got to voice a completely original new Transformers character, and you could choose whatever they turn into, what would you pick, and then how would that inform that character? I love that question. Um, when I was a little kid, I had a Transformers character that I made up. His name was Broadcast. He turned into an old wood panel TV and a satellite, because I love Transformers that were useless. <laughs> My favorite Transformer to play with as a kid was Cassette Man, which was like a knockoff of the toy that Soundwave was based on, and he came with little headphones like Peter Quill wears with a little phone on it, and I would run around the house pretending to listen to Laser Week. Uh, and because of that, I made this triple changer named Broadcast, and that was like my handle and message boards and crazy things 20 years later. Uh, so there, there you go. Broadcast the television slash satellite, if anybody wants to draw that. Uh, actually, I remember in one of the early BotCons, uh, <laughs> Aaron drew for me, because I told him about this thing, and I had this piece of cardboard, because they were drawing on these big pieces of like cardboard that they cut up from like things that they shipped, and then drawing people. So I still have that to this day. I have a rat trap and a broadcast. Yeah. I just thought I, I realized there's like very few people asking questions, so I thought 
uh, kind of joking, but if you want to do it, um, I was just wondering what um, what a Starscream versus Rat Trap argument would sound like, <laughs> like an argument if they had some kind of showing match with something. Um, don't have to do it. I just thought it <laughs> put it up there. Or I don't think they would argue at all. I mean, they're both relatively duplicitous. Hey, what are you talking about? I'm a pretty straightforward rat. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, for the greater good, of course, you believe what you're doing is right. Yeah, I guess uh, I see your point. Yes, yes, but we use our machinations of, um, not evil, but just because it's a, a tool in your tool chest to get the thing done. Well, you know, I think you're right. And you know, I can't get Big Bad always is making me go and hide in uh, the air conditioning ducts. I don't know why we have air conditioning for robots. I know! And Megatron makes me do these insane things! Putting myself in danger! Getting blasted apart all the whole time! You know what, buddy? Let's grab some Megatron. I'm with you. I'm buying <laughs> earlier that you like giant robots, is there any other uh, giant robots? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned earlier you like giant robots. Giant robots, yeah. Is there any other uh, giant robot media that you like at all? Like oh something like Battletech or something? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, well, I used to play Battletech, the miniature game. Those were the first minis that I painted was Battletech. You remember that? Yeah, I did. That was when I first learned how to glue sand from the backyard to the base to look like they were really giant. Mm -hmm. uh, That's terrible. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, I love GoBots and Machine Robo. It's, uh, that, that, I believe the kids call it a banger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, God, I don't know why you said Jack Robots and the, the Big O theme played in my head. Does everybody watch Big O? I've seen Big O, yeah. It's, it's basically Flash Gordon, you mm -hmm. know. Big O. Um, yeah, Robotech. Robotech. And it's, yeah. what's weird is, like, because of what I do for a living, a lot of the guys that you know voice those characters. Like I worked with Tony Oliver a whole bunch. It's Rick Hunter, you know. I just love Thank you. And like, it, it's it's kind of cool, you know. Like, oh, yeah. how you doing? I got your action figure. Yeah. It's, it's but uh, but yeah, I collect too many things. A lot of Diclone stuff too. The new Diclone stuff is really neat. With the with the new tiny tiny little pirates. Mm -hmm. You have a lot. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, since you mentioned the Big O, um, are you familiar, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but there is a, uh, an anime series where they, um, they have a giant super robot, and they're, the whole issue that they have with this in Fighting Aliens is that the budget has been cut by the Earth Defense Forces, so they're not allowed to use any of the special moves, and the actual antagonist is doing the paperwork, and I'm not sure if you what are... Die guard. Die guard. It's it's so they uh, they have to when they fight the aliens they have to sign off on the budget reports. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with with that at all, but no, I, I mean I have to look, look and see if I recognize the art, but I don't remember what we were watching. That's cool. Um, do you like Gundam at all? Gundam, yeah, yeah. I was in a couple of those too. I think. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's kind of, I think a couple of movies and stuff. But you know what it is? Like I love Gundam. I get to be in Gundam. And, I'm like, and none of my characters actually pilot a Gundam, so I can't like, <laughs> buy a model and build it. They're all like the quirky, funny guy who drives a cab and tells you, you know, like, yeah, I want a robot. But. Oh, you were, you were the cab driver in Hathaway? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. I remember the scene uh, very vividly. Yeah, and there was, God, there was another one I was into. I don't remember. But yeah. Oh, do you have a favorite Gundam and a favorite Gundam anime series? Um, uh, honestly, just like the first one. I'm a favorite of them. Um, oh gosh. Let me think about it. <laughs> it's too many. Just kind of piggybacking off the Rat Trap uh, Starscream uh, argument, if uh -oh. you will. Um, we might as well just get, I'll make it short. Uh, when she was little, she brought these uh, wedding Barbie and Ken's over to my house from her mom's house. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a, a Barbie priest or a ship's captain. Uh, who the heck's going to perform this wedding? Um, a, a mayor, and I had Cobra Commander, he would be the mayor of like the Terradrome, right? So I thought, if you would, just for, like very quickly, how would Cobra Commander open up that wedding? <laughs> <laughs> the mayor of Springfield, you mean? That's right. 
Thank you. To you, to you, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, when you're in the booth, um, how much of what you record is like on the script, and how much of it is ad libbed? Mm. <clears throat> it depends. It depends because, like, uh, you know, ADR you really have to stick to it, and then sometimes they might realize, oh, there's an extra flap there that the guy who did the localization, uh, person who did the localization, didn't you know, account for, so they'll have to change it there. Uh, most of the time, for prelay, you know. There's there's room here and there for interpretation, but like for dubbing, you pretty much have to stick to everything because it's measured out, you know. All right, and um, how do you practice uh, improv exactly? Oh gosh, you, you just do it. <laughs> you just do it. I was in way too many uh, improv troops. I was in a, it was an improv troupe for five years called Star Trek. It was uh, improv based on the original Star Trek universe. I think it started in uh, in Austin, Texas, and came to New York. That's when I joined in like, uh, 2007. Um, and then like from there, there's like, National Comedy Theater and People's Improv and you know, all that stuff. You just gotta keep doing it. And eventually, like you know, just it's just like a muscle. You just gotta keep exercising the muscle. Uh, but also like it has to be fun for you. You know. That's the, that's the thing. It's, it's not something you enjoy. There's way too much ramen noodles involved to, uh, <laughs> to get there, but it's fun. Thank you. Of course. Kind of piggybacking off of uh, the Star Trek theme. Uh -oh. uh, I know in like, Power of the Primes, you uh, work with Will Wheaton and oh, yeah. uh, folks like that. I was just wondering, um, did, when you work with these actors, uh, are you all working remotely? Do you get to be in, in like the same room with them and collab? Uh, on particular Power of the Primes, for example? How, how did that work exactly? Uh, for, like, they were all recorded separately. Uh, they recorded us separately, so it would just be like, like I got to see Peter Cullen, but it was just passing the hallway, like, uh, you know. Uh, and then, like, we see, like, the behind the scenes, uh, behind the scenes thing I mentioned. But yeah, they did all of our reports separately. So I actually have never met Willie. Like, we're oh, in, man. like, two seasons of the show together. I've never met him. Like, let's play D&D together. Come on, you know? Uh, it, it all goes back to D&D, um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, and honestly most things are recorded separate now. Like, because you can watch those videos of like, G1 and Thundercats, all those crazy outtakes that we all listen to from Thundercats, uh, of them all together in the studio, and I've done that, but mostly like, if you're doing ADR for a movie or something, you're in the room and you're all walking past the mic and whatnot, but, uh, like for Cuphead, it was all recorded separately. Like, I would go in, and then Drew would go in, and then they sometimes play the line, but just really good direction makes us sound like we're in the same room. It seems to be the normal. Adding on to that, I know past conventions, uh, people like Sue Blue and folks have talked about how the collaborative process when you have a group of people in the room can change the tempo and the pace and can, can uh, affect the storytelling in, in positive ways. Um, do you, uh, have you talked to some of the maybe uh, veterans who've been doing it for a long time who've experience the changes, do, do they talk about how they prefer one or the other, or do you, do you wish you had more opportunities to work in more of a collaborative environment? I mean, I, like, I, for the times I get to, it's super fun. It is super fun. And yeah, we have not, like, where like, there's a lot more joking, but also there's a lot more, like, joking, so it's, it's less, oh, 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 let's get this done. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, both, both have their benefits, I guess. It's also fun to see human beings. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, you're a fan of the genre of many things. You mentioned that Doctor Who and Star Trek and all. So clearly you love this stuff. Uh, of all the different yes, people, yes, them all, so that, uh, <laughs> of all the people you've gotten to work with professionally, mm -hmm. uh, who was the one you were like had the hardest time separating like, the fan in you from the professional in you? Um, I, I never really had like a problem separating. You know, because like, I think because of your love of it, there's like a perspective that comes with it. So like, I've never, you know, it's, it's never really been a problem. It's been really cool, you know, like after I get home or like when the session's over or like after we've worked together three times, I'm like, by the way, you know? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's it, you definitely go into, oh, we're, we're at work now, we're doing this, you know? And then, uh, 
because you, you kind of have to. I mean, we're actors. <laughs> so I'm acting like someone who's not doing backflips on my insides, you know? And gosh, the Welker panel that uh, when, I, when I hosted that, that was the first time I met him. And like, yeah, and then I just turned it into a bit, you know, and played with it. It was fun. You know? Thank you. I have a question. Who's that? The AV guy. Hello! So, since you're one of us and you collect many things, what is your most prized or cherished piece of your collection? Your house is on fire, you go back for one thing and say that. Boy! What would it be? Uh, my fiance, because I love you. <laughs> um, She's not watching. Just say it later, though. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> gosh, favorite. My crystal wizard. I have behind my desk, it's not a transformer or a robot, it's this dumb $5 crystal wizard that has sentimental value. He's uh, translucent blue and he's playing an electric guitar and it was ridiculous. And we always used to joke about it, and he's moved with me every place, and it literally looks like Gandalf with an electric guitar and translucent blue. And I put it in front of the salt lamp so he kind of glows. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I put him next to my Kristar figures, if everybody remembers Chris, the old Remco Kristar figures. Uh, so they, they kind of like a little eerie uh, hair dances to them. But yeah, I guess, I guess uh, it's a terrible answer at Transformers convention, but <laughs> the crystal electric guitar playing wizard. It's basically getting weird, guys. Yeah, <laughs> All right, um, I've got a gross question. All right, um, gross um, question. So, I've recorded my voice recently. Mm. You can't help but notice when you go back to listen. Sometimes there's clicks, there's pops, there's slimy noises. Uh, how do you deal with that, especially when you are <laughs> working on your own and it's kind of maybe your responsibility? Nobody's there, maybe nobody's there to say, hey, can you do that again? Uh, you can. I, I crank myself super high in, in the cans, and they're noise canceling, so anything that I hear is coming from me. Uh, you know, stomach growling, weird human thing. I mean, we're all in a bunch of meat puppets anyway, so it's going to make some noise. So, uh, great band, too. Uh, there we go, dating myself. Um, I mean, you just got to be aware of it. You know, eventually it just becomes second nature. We're like, oh no, there's a click on that. You take a sip of water, take a sip of water. And that's really the cure for everything is take a sip of water. Like I just took a sip of water as you said that because instinctually you said mouth noise and I said like, uh. so, yeah. Cool thing. I'm pretty sure I remember broadcasts. You do? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to call it at this point. That's it. Uh, right. I see I see Evangelist is over here. He's got oh, hey, he's got a thing to do. Dude, I didn't see you. Hi. Hi. What's up, man? I'm just chilling out by all the equipment. Not doing anything. <laughs> but I think the most important thing we can take out of all of this today is you'll let the rat burn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here.